Bitte. Hi Klaus. I'm at 65 percent <laughs> with the slides. Okay, we are live. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the session on the EACS uh, medical technology portfolio. And uh, our goal today is to describe the strategy at EAC to fund and to manage our pipeline of medical technologies. Um, there are some novelties at, at our end. Um, the main reason for these changes are our interest in increasing the number of R&D projects that actually deliver a solution in the clinic, uh, solutions for the patient and for companies uh, looking at uh, new licensing deals, new company creation. So our first goal will be to sort of describe what's new at our end in terms of funding projects and managing them. Um, a second goal is to describe um, with our panel um, the trends in medical devices and technologies, but also to sort of help identifying the key factors that could make the EAC projects interesting from the perspective of the private sector. And also that includes investors and it also includes industrial partners. Um, it's clear to us managing the medical technology pipeline that the information should flow um, between the private sector and the R&D projects and the funding entities. So this event today is part of that uh, flow by direction of flow of information. So first thing I would like to do is to introduce our panel today. We have um, a distinguished panel, um, Klaus Welter. He's the CEO of Stockert. Uh, it's a medtech company, well-established um, in Germany over three decades. Um, they develop products and market them in the area of heart arrhythmia, um, radio frequency ablation, and also nervous stimulation. He also brings into the discussion an interesting angle from the investment side because um, so he's a representative of a private equity fund that invested in the company. So he has both the industrial and the investment knowledge. Very interesting for the discussion. Francesco Petrini, um, he's the CEO of Sensors. Sensors is a startup uh, partly funded um, by EAC. And they're working on a very interesting neuroprosthesis product. Uh, he will be presenting that product. This is designed for amputees uh, to regain uh, touch sense uh, by stimulating um, the remaining segments of nerves, peripheral nerves. We have James uh, Mosson today with us. He's the CEO of Mausonia. He's a publisher, author, expert. He's been commenting on the venture capital industry and corporate venture capital industry for a number of years. And he's also an expert in matchmaking uh, between investors and startups. So he brings sort of broad knowledge across spaces and across geographies as well. And Carl van Hembeek, um, he's the general manager at Cochlear Technology Center. And as you probably know, uh, in neural prosthesis, um, cochlear implants are probably the biggest success ever, maybe comparable to the brain stimulation for Parkinson's. Um, he has a lot of knowledge in the cochlear implant area and also a vision for the future in his company. And he clearly knows what his company is looking for in terms of um, future investment in technology. Okay, so the first thing I would like to do um, is to thank um, all the all the speakers and um, describe uh, what's new at the funding end. Um, as I mentioned before, our big interest now is to achieve a higher success rate in terms of generating devices that go to market from the early stage ideas. And there are two big tools that have been implemented, are being implemented at our end. One initial big tool is the creation of the program manager or portfolio manager role. And I'm the portfolio manager for medical technologies. Um, so the idea is that we bring in individuals like myself that have some technology and market knowledge, and we help the projects to move along the pipeline from the early stage idea up to the end of the, of the pipeline. We also put out um, a specific topic focused calls and the idea is that the portfolio managers like myself identify gaps in our list of projects in our in our pipeline in our portfolio and we try to cover those gaps providing additional funding so um, portfolio managers to some extent um, replicate at the eac the model of a vc portfolio manager we will follow projects, we'll try to help projects, we'll identify the most promising ones and ensure that there is no gap in the pipeline from the idea to the market. 
Um, let's uh, please bring up my slides uh, very quickly, just a couple of slides. Can you do this, uh, Ben, for me? Thank you. So this is a summary of the of the pipeline. So we have like three stages at this moment. We have an early stage on the left-hand side where projects come in early stage. We have right now around 50 projects that will be alive um, next year. And they, some of those will migrate to transition phase where they are trying to become investable. So the first stage Pathfinder, we provide so sort of several million euros to a consortium, as usual, as in the past, with Fed Open and Fed Proactive. It's now called Pathfinder. And some of those projects will clearly generate a device that's uh, functional and it can become investable. So we will provide a second round of funding that we call transition. The details are still to be sketched out, but they're going to be several million euros. And then there's a third phase, which you probably know, um, where we can provide up to 15 millions in equity and a couple of million grand. And at that stage, the product should be uh, ready for CE marking uh, under the umbrella of our company and ready for market. Let's go to the second slide, please. Well, I just wanted to provide a very quick overview of the sort of technologies we have. Uh, I will just glance over them very quickly. So in our portfolio of about 200 projects, and we have already invested over 400 million euros in that portfolio, we have neural prosthesis, we have uh, new imaging modalities, we have intraoperative technologies, for example, in endoscopy and others, perinatal care, um, organ on a chip, we have dialysis technology, we have uh, thrombosis technology, quite a lot of heart-related projects um, like transcatheter valve replacement. And we have a number of enabling components that are developed within existing projects, but that could be reused in other projects. That includes, for example, light sources or light sensors, high sensitivity single pixel sensors or array um, nano um, um, uh, photodetector arrays. Those components can be reused in other projects. So um, let's go now and, and um, ask Francesco, please, to describe his specific project. He's, again, the CEO of Sensars, and this project is at the transition stage. It has moved beyond early stage idea. It's not yet at the accelerator phase, but it's becoming investable. Here we go. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, again, Francesco, co-founder and CEO of Sensor Senior Prosthetics. Uh, we are uh, pioneers, uh, pioneers uh, in, the, um, in the field of nerve machine interfaces uh, for the restoration of touch and movement sensation from the prosthesis of leg amputees. In the next few minutes, uh, I will show you how um, We are benefiting of the support for transferring our innovation from the, from the research stage to the market. SenseArts um, is a spin-off of uh, EPFL of Lausanne, a polytechnic school in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, it was founded, co-founded by uh, three researchers um, of that school, which led the first uh, implant of electrodes in the nerves of amputees uh, for the restoration of sensory feedback from a prosthetic hand. Um, this prosthesis, uh, um, uh, this new approach, received a nice recognition from uh, um, and the research community and the media. After that, this was 2014, we started to develop our business model, our business plan. Um, and we understood that um, an application with uh, higher needs for uh, stakeholders, patients, uh, um, health care uh, and prosthesis manufacturers uh, could be um, in the uh, lower limb prosthetics. Also, we discovered that 80% um, of uh, um, uh, the global prosthetics market is represented by prosthetic legs. With this background, we um, applied for a FET launchpad, which is what Eric mentioned as the second stage in the translation from the research uh, to the market. Um, with the FET launchpad, indeed, we, um, we, we got the financing from the European Commission for validating our assumptions on the business model, on the business plan. We interviewed stakeholders, so we prepared collaborations for the implementation of the business plan, and we prepared a prototype for a pilot trial. 
the prototype is sensi, a unique worldwide device for the restoration of sensory feedback from the prosthesis of leg amputees. We add the sensor ID insole under the prosthetic foot. The information um, from, the, from the insole is delivered to an external controller, which transduces it in the language of the nervous system, delivered to the nervous system itself through uh, an implant stimulating system constituted by an implantable stimulator and the electrodes implanted transversally into the sciatic nerve. Being uh, the electrodes implanted transversally, the core of our innovation. Then nature does the rest because the signals from the nerve of the subject are conveyed to the brain of the subject, which is able to perceive what happens at the prosthesis. We have tested this in a pilot trial together with the prosthesis manufacturer leader, which is a SOAR. We've shown the data uh, with data from three patients that restoring sensory feedback, you can increase the perception of the prosthesis as part of the body. You can treat uh, neuropathic chronic pain, phantom limb pain, decrease the risk of falls, uh, increase the mobility and reduce the fatigue. Patients and doctors were both thrilled by this innovation. We received again a nice recognition from the media and uh, from the scientific community. With this background, we were able to apply also to another support from the European Commission, which is the Fast Track to Innovation. This is um, a call in which uh, an industry-driven consortium must take the innovation to the market in three years. We managed to get this grant and now we are in the stage in which we are um, finally transferring our technology to the market. We're going to finalize our industrial prototype in 2021 for going through validation and verification tests, including preclinical validation with animals, for starting a clinical trial for obtaining um, CE mark. Product launch is estimated by December 2023. In conclusion, we are, um, and this is the reason why we got invited by, by Eric today, we are uh, a real example of how the EIC can really be of support for a startup because you start from a FET, which is where we started. Um, a FET called Nebias, where we explore the possibility of interfacing the peripheral nervous system of amputees for the restoration of a feedback. With that, we managed to receive a FET launchpad, which we used for validating business plan and business model, doing a pilot trial, gathering the, the minimum requirement for applying for a fast track to innovation, and now we're going towards the market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco. Um, very clear presentation and you managed to stick to the time plan. Thank you so much. Um, let's start um, bringing in the, the, the panel. Uh, let's start, for example, with Carl. Um, so we have a look, quick look at the portfolio we have. You've seen one example from Francesco, which is a very interesting example moving into the market. Uh, it will be very interesting for us to hear about Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, it would be extremely interesting for us, um, Carl, to hear about Cochlear, uh, the trends you see in, in your market. What's your company uh, looking for in terms of technologies? Over to you, Carl. Mm. Okay, the image is, is frozen. Okay, maybe we can we can change the order in the round, and then maybe Cal can fix the technical uh, problems. I'm. Oh, I'm you're there, there Enrique. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, the image is frozen, but we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Do you want us to show these slides, maybe? I think he's uh, chopped off Enrique. It yes. looks like he's going to restart. I would he's gone. Okay, so let, let's change the order in the round. No problem. Uh, Klaus, would you like to take that one from um, Stoker's perspective? So in terms of looking for new technologies, um, what is Stoker looking for in the future? Where is the future going in terms of heart and, and nerve stimulation technologies? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Uh, you know, the... In, we are specifically targeting the electrophysiology space. And uh, what has happened there in the past few years is it's a rapidly growing market. The uh, market grows by about roughly 10% a year. 
and a lot of progress has been made in uh, both location and treatment. But then, it, and what you see today is that uh, procedures can be safely done. They are pretty repeatable in the hands of good surgeons, but the need is growing. So I think what the future calls for really is, is, uh, is basically improvements in how do you actually do the localization of where you want to ablate uh, the heart. So uh, localization means, and there uh, specifically, how do you avoid uh, all the challenges that you have with uh, the high amounts of radiations that surgeons are getting. It's not so much a problem of the patient, but very much a problem of the surgeon, the amount of radiation they get. And um, secondly, how do you further streamline the procedure that you can uh, execute the procedure safely and fast? And there, uh, new ablation technologies come in today, uh, such as... Um, such as pulse field, uh, pulse field uh, treatment or uh, technologies that actually improve the safety uh, of the procedure so that the main uh, adverse events that are uh, actually ablating, um, ablating nerves or ablating uh, the esophagus uh, can be avoided. So those are the main areas that uh, we see in the EP space. And similarly in the neurospace, uh, there's probably uh, two very obvious targets. One is the huge market uh, that you have in chronic pain. And if you look at the, the amount of people that have chronic pain and that get treated by medications more or less successfully uh, over long term, I think there's a huge huge opportunity for uh, a device option for treatment uh, of those kinds of patients. And there has been some progress, but uh, to date, actually, uh, I think there's still a big void and a big need. Yeah, we do have um, quite a number of projects. Um, one in particular I'm thinking of um, relating to ablation, but there's a general trend that you can see in the portfolio and the, and the projects we are getting towards getting more sensors, more electronics at the tip of catheters, mm -hmm. for example. And this is a general trend, putting in more electronics, more and more um, within smaller spaces and at the tip of catheters. So that might be an interesting aspect of the portfolio um, to look at. Um, so the same question to Carl, if, if the technical issues are more or less solved, um, would you like to take the question, uh, Carl? So what, what's cochlear looking for? What is the, what's the trend for the cochlear implant community? I think you're frozen again. Okay. So. We move on, move on, and then we'll see if he's back. So, Jim, uh, from the investors community, what's the appetite in general? I'll be talking to uh, Klaus and Francesco and Carl about these new technologies. There is always some risk associated, and the investor community is sometimes a bit hesitant. Um, what's the sentiment? What, what's the feeling you get um, from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Enrique. It's a great pleasure to be here and hear such uh, experts on the session. So. Um, there's two answers broadly here, Henry. There's the sort of broad answer within the investor community around innovation more broadly, and then specifically within medical devices and technology. So broadly, what we're seeing is that actually there's still a lot of appetite among VCs, corporate venturers, governments, universities to support innovation. And that's actually slightly still surprising. If you think around COVID over the past six months and the economic impact that's been having in on societies, normally you would expect investors to be doing far less than they actually are. There's a, still a lot of big rounds happening and there's a lot of activity and interest in companies that can show growth or can show the disruptive transformative technologies. But that's in general, that's in areas such as um, healthcare, around sort of telemedicine. It's in areas such as oncology and cancer. It's in things like IT more broadly, software as a service, 
or quantum computing, you know, things around energy and sort of other areas. Within medical devices and technology, actually it's been relatively speaking an area of the market where corporates and other investors haven't necessarily provided the follow on funding that perhaps the sector has deserved. I think the returns in general have been good, but it just hasn't been a lot of capital flowing into it. And that remains the case now. And I think there still remains a degree of sort of issues around not just the issues of can the pilot projects work? Can they then be scaled up and find a market where they can be recompensed? Are uh, some of the challenges. And then third, given the nature of medical technologies and devices where often they're implanted, there can be a sort of reputation or even a sort of uh, longer term risk or liability if those technologies actually don't necessarily work or cause unintended consequences. And so I think within that space, within medical devices and technologies, there still remains a niche market of people like Boston Scientific or J&J, where it's corporate led who have the understanding and also have the scale to help that entrepreneurial device actually reach the market and reach its full potential. So it still remains from an investor point of view, a market where corporates or really knowledgeable investors take the lead and then try and get the crowd to the end, the follow on funded. And this is where I think the EIC is so critical and transformative, providing some of that validation, funding, and then bringing in the rest of the market. Carl, do we have you? Yes. Yes. Do you want to step in and maybe address this question about what's next um, technology wise for Cochlear? Let's see if it works. We don't hear you. Well, we cannot hear you. No, we don't. We don't hear you. No, no. Um, let's try and, and fix that. Uh, in the meantime, as I was um, uh, listening to your comments, James, so this is interesting if Klaus wants to st step in as well, because I, I always felt the level of risk um, that investors can take is relatively low, and particularly for MedTech with very long product development cycles, it's particularly tough. Um, so uh, Klaus, how do you see this aspect of risk taking? Because I think from your end, probably you cannot take, you cannot take that much risk. Um, uh, you probably want to look at projects that are pretty much mature, functionally tested, maybe even at the clinical level before you really get involved. What's your feeling about this? Uh, absolutely, and Enrique, I think you're, you're very correct on this one. And you know, I can actually uh, give you two perspectives, one from a relative small private equity, and then I worked a long time in uh, a big organization uh, where we looked at startups all the time. And <clears throat> the level of risk taking was actually not that dissimilar, frankly. So uh, we would definitely not want to look at startups where what you described before, there's still a lot of uh, proof to be done of the concept, uh, proof of the clinical value and um, avoidance of the side effects. So really what what we are looking for and have been looking for was always technology that is proven um, where you have a clear demonstrated um, sense of purpose of the project ideally uh, and that's where where you come in again uh, very useful with your back-end financing you want to have the clinical studies done because for many markets nowadays they are extremely critical to even get a company interested to take the to take the risk of uh, building a sales force because un unless you have the clinical data to validate the, the payers that your concept is worth paying for, it just is not attractive. And uh, I think that is where you come in. So I, frankly, I think that the addition of the part three uh, of your funding is a huge step in the right direction. Um, uh, Francesco, are you seeing, when you're contacting the venture capital arena, 
uh, if you are already uh, starting around, uh, is your um, impression similar to what uh, Klaus and James are, are describing? So difficult unless you de-risk the project uh, to really get some interest, right? So first of all, my experience uh, is only connected to, to Europe. I, I didn't have so much of, uh, uh, of an impression from, uh, from the States, uh, from China, anywhere. So I can speak only for Europe. Uh, for Europe, I want to say that actually the, the direction is really this one that has been mentioned so far. Um, European investors uh, do not want to risk so hugely um, on things that have to be, that have to be proven yet. Uh, even though I have seen, and this is talking for my experience, I've seen though um, some projects maybe for um, for the amount uh, of revolution and disruption we're uh, inserting into the field. That maybe in that case some exception was done, and uh, mostly must I guess that mostly must depends also on the on the field. Maybe. Pain can be more attractive than orthopedics, and this is why maybe in a in a bigger bigger market an investor tends to to get a risk that is a little higher uh, compared to a market uh, uh, that is a little smaller, and then the investor tends to get a lower lower risk. Um, I was checking the chat and we got a few questions. One question was whether the EAC pipeline accepts uh, new projects. Uh, of course it does. So there are multiple rounds of funding and some of them are open to all topics and some of them are sort of uh, challenge focused. Uh, so do, do check our website from time to time because there will be multiple calls. Um, that's very good. So I wanted to ask uh, Jim, and by the way, I probably should uh, make a reminder because I see some messages asking about your background because I did the introduction initially and maybe somebody join us later on. So again, James Mason is from Mount Sonia, expert in venture capital industry, uh, publisher and author in the field. Francesco is a CEO of a startup developing neural prosthesis, partly funded by us, the EAC. And Klaus Welte is the CEO of an of a established medtech company. And Carl, which is uh, who's going in and out depending on the technical difficulties, uh, he's the general manager of the Cochlear Technology Center in, in Belgium. I don't know whether uh, Carl is with us at the moment. Carl, are you there? He's gone again. He's he, he's he's having issues. Okay. Uh, so Jim, I wanted to know a little bit about uh, the matchmaking side uh, of this world. I mean, you have a lot of experience connecting uh, established companies. Uh, like Stockards uh, and other companies uh, with projects. And you've seen the process happening. Um, what's your experience? What does seem to work for both sides so that the industrial side doesn't feel, oh, uh, people are wasting their time and the startup side realizes they're facing people who can really collaborate with? What, what does seem to work in your experience in terms of matchmaking? Yeah, thanks, Enrique. And yeah, it's a really interesting area. So, um, you know, Typically, traditionally, there's been an information asymmetry. So typically and traditionally, rolling the clock back, say, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, the investors, typically the VC investors raising money from institutions like pension funds, would know more about how to structure a deal and what types of entrepreneurs they would back than the entrepreneurs. So it felt very much that when it comes to matchmaking, the entrepreneurs were going out almost with a begging bowl and saying, oh, please fund us, because there wasn't necessarily the support ecosystem to help them develop their ideas. You know, and she would want to, you know, she would want the capital to do it. You know, but over time, what's happened thanks to the internet and thanks to just this general increase in entrepreneurial interest and in innovation capital has been that matchmaking has become a lot more even because ultimately the VC investors or the venture investors are trying to compete with each other to get the really good entrepreneurs because there is a sort of an outlier performance. The really good entrepreneurs will deliver most of the financial returns and deliver most of the really interesting returns back to society. And then once that starts to get more level in terms of the entrepreneur realizing their worth and going to different VC investors and also looking at 
other pockets of capital, whether it's the EIC or corporations or sovereign wealth funds or universities and angels, then they, the entrepreneur can say, actually, I'm looking for five things. I want capital, but I also need customers. I need to develop my product or service. I need to hire the right people. And at some stage, I will need to exit, whether it's a, a flotation, an IPO or a trade sale or something else. And I think that matchmaking, therefore, has become a lot more equal between understanding what the entrepreneur, what she wants, with actually what the investors can provide, because capital is ultimately fungible. You can go to any VC and fundamentally get the same type of thing. So, in effect, it becomes much harder for the VC to stand out and they have to try and show more added value and how they support the entrepreneur. So I think when it comes to the sort of the matchmaking piece between investors, industrial partners and companies, the entrepreneur has a lot, if they're any good, has a lot more ability to ask questions at the start about what type of syndicate, what type of support they want from whom, and that might be in different markets in Asia, in US as well as in Europe. It might be different technologies to help with the product development, hiring the right people, you know, eventually people who can help with the sort of the exit route as well. And I think that level of um, sort of balance, I think is really positive. And this is a game where I think the European Commission and particularly the EIC is a particularly useful way of helping to identify excellence, a little like the European Research Council, trying to understand at that foundational level what projects or ideas can really be interesting, trying to then create this idea of which entrepreneurs, whether Francesco, you know, we just heard such exciting developments in that area. It's really powerful and game-changing. But I think being able to say, actually, how do we find these investors and bring this balance together. I think that's probably the most interesting area. And in terms of the sort of types of events, obviously, you know, um, at Global Corp Venturing, which is one of the publications we do, we also do one around global university venturing about some of the startups and uh, student spin outs and faculty startups that are coming out and global impact venturing, which is how governments are using impact investment tools or the sustainable development goals to identify some of these opportunities. We're seeing tools that digitally can complement the in real life personal events. So, you know, so I think it's actually a great time to be an entrepreneur and going out and saying, actually, we're really good. We can find the money to keep us going. What we're looking for is this and this, and then it becomes much more equal. Um, in terms of um, how mature the project um, should be for industry to be interested, um, um, Klaus, Francesca, do you think that probably depends on the size of the company as well? So I imagine a stocker might be looking at situations where the device has been, of course, verified at the lab level, but then also tested animal models and clinical testing already. Maybe other companies might need even further testing, whereas um, some of the big giants may, uh, might accept projects at earlier stage. Um, what, for example, for a stalker, what would be a, a, the, the type of maturity that um, would make it interesting for you? So we're, talking problem, we're, we're probably talking about some human data already at the clinical level. Um, what's a type of um, project package that you would take in general? Yeah, I would say we would take projects that that are technologically in terms of in terms of industrialization. They probably uh, can have some gaps because the industrialization is something where where we are really good at, and uh, that is something where we actually feel some of the inventors probably um, take more. Um, um, more steps towards uh, finishing the product than we would need uh, in terms of perfecting the product. But you're, co you're absolutely correct. What we are looking for really is the, is the clear proven benefit of the product and uh, some for sure the animal data and some human data as well so that we can assess uh, is this a product that really would fit our pipeline uh, would fit our portfolio as a company and how do we actually 
uh, commercialize this best and and what markets do we target um, again we are a company that uh, we don't have our own sales force we actually commercialize again then via the big companies so basically our role in this whole game is is, is somewhere of an in-between role between a between a technology technological idea uh, and a finished product that is ready uh, to be taken by one of the big uh, medical technology companies. So, um, again, technology development, industrialization does not need to be perfect, but clearly work on the clinical benefit and work on um, how do you differentiate as well between the between the technologies that are already available and how do you bring value for the patient the clinician or the hospital or the payer i think i think that as a nice um, entrepreneur this is one of the of the homework that the entrepreneur itself should do. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, the, the reply that Klaus has, has, has given uh, could be completely different uh, from, from a different actor. There are different medical devices companies uh, and there are different markets. So for example, if you speak with the, with the companies in orthopedics, uh, which are the homework that I had to do in the beginning, um, uh, they clearly need the, 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 the clinical validation to, to, to have been done. But uh, for example, uh, mm, from device, from product to product, uh, they they do like to see a little bit of sales and revenues put in place, um, and that is when we speak about orthopedics. Uh, when you explore instead, for example, an exit, uh, because this is important for the exit at the end of the story. When you explore the exit uh, with Boston Scientific or Medtronic uh, or uh, Saint Jude, uh, Abbott, etc. Um, then it depends because, for example, Medtronic made exits of companies that had just finished uh, clinical trials, uh, companies that had to start clinical trials, uh, and uh, companies that had made sales. So it, it really depends on the on the on the target. So the entrepreneur should do this homework first to to know to know where it is going. One of the roles of the portfolio managers, I guess, he actually is to see. Um, hotspots, sort of gaps and trends and opportunities. And I wanted to share with you some ideas about this and see how you feel about those and what other trends you see. So we see, for example, that at the level of the nervous system, both CNS and a spinal cord, um, being essentially um, an electrical tissue, electroactive tissue, there is so much what one can do in general terms, speaking general terms, in terms of stimulation and recording uh, within neuro disease in general. And if you couple that to the capacity we have now to do, you know, low power, miniaturized, high miniaturization, uh, low invasiveness in the implantation, for example, um, there, is, there seems to be so much potential in devices that are, for example, implantable at the spinal cord for chronic pain. There's quite a lot, but it seems like if the market still needs new technology, at the level of the CNS, you could have implants at multiple levels, of course, the visual implant is sort of an old topic, but you have the possibility of implanting at the cortex level, at the hippocampus level, and there is a lot going on uh, at, the, at the level of the vagus nerve, for example, uh, with all the implications that the stimulation of the vagus nerve can have even at the level of CNS. Um, so would you agree that this could be one of the uh, big hotspots where, you know, implantable devices, but also non-implantable, because you could do transcranial stimulation, non-implantable version, trans, you know, transcranial magnetic or TDCS. Uh, so there are many uh, modalities uh, coming up, and it seems like there is a long, long, long path ahead, and, and there is a, a lot of opportunities for stimulation and recording of CNS, spinal cord, peripheral nerves. Do you, do you see that as an interesting hotspot in the market? Um, any of you, Klaus, if you like? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think you put it very, uh, very correct. It, it's a long road, and uh, the implantables, especially in the simulation space, go back probably fifteen years at least. And um, to date, actually, I find that 
uh, in the daily practice, they have not made the impact I would have thought they would have made by today. And I'm not sure whether that's a technology issue or uh, probably to a certain extent also a question of uh, price versus performance in many markets. But um, definitely there's a, there's a huge amount of things that you can imagine that can happen in the next decade, uh, both on implantables and non-implantables. And I would believe that uh, definitely both areas have their uh, have their space and have their uh, have their role because um, the implantables, the the level of involvement and the the cost involved and all the problems that you deal with over long term um, certainly deserve or need a much higher benefit in order to make it viable. So, absolutely, both uh, spaces are very interesting, and I also think frankly, that um, there's still a role for uh, location or po and positioning like uh, robotics. So putting implants where they need to be. Um, there's a, and there's a need still for patient-specific um, building, especially in the prosthetic space. Uh, there's a lot of areas where uh, the patient specificity uh, will play a big role too. So. Um, those are other areas that I believe will be very interesting in the future. It's interesting because in the case of Parkinson, despite the therapeutic potential fully demonstrated of deep brain stimulation, you still find many patients, and probably I would feel the same, that it's very invasive. Uh, they would, most of these patients always say they would accept anything before they actually test the brain stimulation, even though it's been a, a big success therapeutically, but it is very invasive. It's like a major step. And then when you look at the functionality of the uh, DBS over time, um, if the clinician offers you two or three years of functionality for that implantable device, and you have to go through the stress, the emotional stress, so that maybe this, it's an aspect as well to make it less invasive and maybe psychologically more acceptable for the patient. What are you seeing, Francesco, in, in orthopedics? Uh, you're looking probably at this cost-benefit ratio. Uh, what is the market telling you? What are the hotspots there in orthopedics around you? Well, um, Klaus mentioned already that uh, the, the personalization of robotics uh, um, is a challenge that there is room there. Um, uh, today, today, indeed, um, one of the reasons why um, prosthetic devices still cost much for patients is the fact that at an industrial level, they do not manage to provide something that can be, uh, that can be scaled um, highly because indeed you need to personalize everything on the single patient. And so you don't need to produce, for example, I don't know, thousands, thousands and thousands of prosthetics uh, because they want to apply all the same for every patient. So that is, uh, that is one point. And the second point, um, it is really what I'm, what I'm working at. Um, improving the, the interfacing between the, the, the prosthetics and, uh, and the body, because at the moment the prosthetics is something completely unconnected to the body and um, restoring the sensory feedback uh, and also uh, providing a better control of the prosthetic device. Uh, I think those are the, the, the biggest challenges um, orthopedic companies are working on presently at the moment. So, uh, Jim, have you seen uh, an evolution at the level of the events where you're connecting medtech and um, startups. Is there a trend in what um, VCs are looking for? Um, for example, is this a good time for higher risk projects or for mostly de-risk projects? I know this, this goes in waves sometimes. Oh. Yeah, I mean, so the big disruption that's happening in the space is the arrival of some of the main technology players who are using AI or using their technology prowess. Think about Apple, you know, it has a phone. You know, it is thinking about that as an effect a medical device. It's being sort of passed by the FDA as a medical device to think about sleep apnea, think about other areas. You know, think around Elon Musk, you know, does Tesla, but it's 
you know, also working on the Neuralink. So I think the big disruption that's happening and the big excitement will be to go from the sort of Medtronic, Boston Scientifics, Johnson and Johnson's, those types of companies or Philips in Europe and what they've been thinking around in terms of medical devices and actually seeing that whole market expand much more exponentially about how you know, medical devices become part of us, that sort of transhumanist movement, you know, because ultimately, you know, the sort of science fiction of the 60s and 70s on Star Trek around the Borg or whatever it might be, actually is is very much happening. Everyone already, look at us, most of us wear glasses. Most of us over time will need some sort of hearing aid. You know, there's a great company uh, coming out of Israel, you know, where the sort of the founder sold his prior company for 15 billion mobile to intel it was autonomous vehicle his next one is helping his mother you know who's slightly blind have a little attachment to be able to be told what the page says but that doesn't just work for people who are visually impaired it works for people who are illiterate and there's 800 million of those people so i think the medical devices medical technology is going from in effect a small cluster to be in something that's going to affect 7 billion people. And I think that's the real opportunity in scale. And that's what the excitement that Europe can look forward to if, thanks to your work at the EIC, Enrique, and the great founders like Francisco and the established companies like, you know, uh, you know such as Klaus's are already doing. It's just bringing that ecosystem together and saying the opportunities aren't this. The opportunities are as big as you can dream. And I think that's exciting. Okay, so I think we, we got to the end of our slot. Um, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Klaus, Francesco, uh, Jim. I'm sorry, Carl couldn't uh, eventually solve uh, his technical problems. Um, so please do follow us, uh, the audience, um, on our website, the EAC. There will be calls and, and new plans. And, and I hope to see you all around very soon and we continue working together. Thanks for your time and for your insight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Here. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day.